Hello everyone. You're really welcome to the alternative to Skullnaglarshach 2020, the festival of early Irish harp which normally takes place each August in Kilkenny in Ireland. Between the 13th and 17th of August 2020, we'll be joining together each day to watch a talk, a workshop and concert footage from previous Skullina. Find out more on our website at irishharp.org. It's day one, Thursday the 13th of August. Welcome to our first talk. This is really the last formal scholarly <laughs> workshop session of Skull 2019. Once, we, once this finishes, we'll have a quick turnover and we'll have a closing celebratory backlog and reception of the Nancy Hall. But um, for, the, for the last workshop session, we we'll have Siobhan Armstrong, and I think she might be able to, in some ways, summarise some of the things that we've been working on for the whole week. So, Siobhan, I'm sure. Okay, thank you. The title is, Do We Want to Try to Sound Like Only Old Irish Harpers Leaning Into Idiomatic Historical Irish Harping? Oh, I see. <laughs> Thank you very much. I have taken nothing but abuse for this title for about six months. And I'm sticking with it because I lean into these things. So you can all take a running jump. I don't care. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Okay, this festival clearly needs to end. <laughs> because there's a st distinct, the, the respect quotient is just dry. <laughs> Okay, so presumably you all came to an early Irish harp summer school and festival because you're interested in how the early Irish harpers played the music centuries before the tradition died out. Though, of course, as we know from some of you, some of you just come for the food. And the harping, <laughs> and the, and the harping is just this lovely optional extra. <laughs> I assume that if you're here that you're interested in the HHSI approach to the Irish harp tradition, which is one of HIP, Historically Informed Performance. So, as an organization, we support the research of and we guide the building of copies of old harps and we let those copies teach us how to play them. So that's one aspect of our work, is uh, trying to get the, the instruments, uh, trying to play historical instruments or copies of historical instruments. Then we try to recreate the playing techniques as best we can that are spoken about in contemporary music accounts. We look at any of the remaining harp manuscripts, for example, the bunting manuscripts, to glean what we can of the historical repertory. We listen to any of the songs that are still performed, or the instrumental pieces that have been carried on being played by other traditional instruments, like the pipes, so we've had pipers here this week, like the fiddle, we've had one of Ireland's best fiddle players here, or the flute. Um, or songs or instrumental pieces that have carried on in the tradition that can be accessed through archive recordings to see if we can learn from them. Or failing that, other performances from archive recordings to see what we can learn from that. So out of all of that, we, we try to help to create music that, if we're really lucky, may have something in common with what listeners heard pre-1800. And I say may have in common because I think um, I'm happy to say that among um, all, most of us here, there's a humility before the music. We don't come to it from a, we know, we know what we're doing, and God forbid that we know more than you do. No, we are all here at the service of the music. And so we come to it in humility, trying to see if there's anything we can, we can recreate. But knowing that, uh, that we're going to fail. This we have, to, we have to take on boards from the beginning. We will fail in this task because we have uh, the chances that we're really recreating uh, what was heard in the past are very small. Um, however, we like to fail at this job because in failing, maybe we get a little bit closer than other people who aren't even trying. And there's no reason why you should try, but we choose to try. So what I'd like to suggest firstly for you at the... Uh, You've, you've all been through the week. You've all heard what we've had to say in workshops, in classes, in private tuition. So what I would like to suggest to you at the end of this week is that you set your goals really high. That you aspire not just to play the right notes in the right place or even on a copy of an old Irish harp, laudable as that would be, but that you try ultimately as you improve technically 
to situate yourself within the Gaelic music world. And of course that's difficult for those of you who don't live anywhere near the Gaelic world. Uh, but I hope we've shown you ways this week, and I, I hope we've given you examples in some of the best musicians in Ireland who have come here, uh, to inspire you that you can listen to recordings, you can go on YouTube, you can find sources of music. So aspire very high. Try to, to situate yourself somewhere within the Gaelic music world. Try to listen to the best solo performers on, on uh, modern recordings or on archive recordings. Um, most of it is free on the web. You don't even have to spend money anymore to listen to this. Get a feel for the style. That's why we completely revamped the timetable this year, so that we would give you, at 9.30 every morning, the best access, the closest access you can possibly get, which is to have a master in this very room to whom you can listen and with whom you can talk. Um, I'm not saying that the, uh, the early Irish harp is comparable with all of the things you've heard, but it should somehow exist in the same universe. It's from the same culture, it accompanies singing in the Irish language, so you should be looking to listen, listen, listen. And everybody said that, Ronan said it, Paddy Glacken said it, Sarah Grealish said it this morning. You have to listen to excellent Irish performers, both instrumentalists and singers, to develop a sense of how to have some sophistication and nuance in your playing. Try also to become familiar with the evidence in the surviving manuscripts, because there's lots of evidence in there that can help us. How they played, how they damped strings, how they, what fingering patterns they use, what, their, what was going on in the bass voices on their harp, if there is a bass voice, what's their, what's their right hand playing how they ornamented their tunes. All of these things are relevant for all of us. So give yourself those parameters within which to work. This week, we hope, will give you a good head start with all of that. Some of you are clearly already on the road. Some of you, have, uh, some of you are, are uh, starting out on that road. Um, some of you have joined us for the first time this year, so you may be completely exhausted at this stage of the week. Um, <laughs> What do you mean, seven? <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. Okay, some of the wimps may be exhausted. The rest of us are ready for a second week. Um, so keep moving along that road. We are all moving along that road. Um, some of us are ahead of others, but nobody's at the end of the road. It's not possible. So we're all moving along the road, so let's keep moving in that direction. Let's keep helping each other. Let's keep being collegial. To inspire you, here's what Edward Bunting says about a harper he listened to, about Dennis O'Hampsey, uh, and about a harper whose playing he was told about. So, and that harper is Dominic Mungan. So uh, with Dominic Mungan, he says, he was a most admirable performer. Dominic Mungan is one of the 18th century harpers. Uh, he is the most, sorry, that's bunting, so I'll get, just get rid of that for a second. Uh, he was a most admirable performer. Those jangling of the strings so general among ordinary practitioners were never heard from the harp in his hands. But it was in the piano passages that he chiefly excelled. These came out with an effect indescribably charming. His whispering notes were, until lately, in the memory of a few surviving auditors, they commenced in a degree of piano that required the closest approach to the instrument to render them at first audible, but increased by degrees to the richest chords, so pianissimo up to the richest chords. In their greatest degree of softness, they resembled rather the sympathetic tones than those brought out by the fingers. So... Think about that. There's, there's great um, nuance in his playing and there's great dynamic change in his playing. And we don't always hear that from all of us who play the harp yet. We don't hear huge dynamic change. So remember, one man at least was playing very pianissimo up to the richest, fullest chords. So Mungan had huge control over his volume level. And he's very nuanced. Then we have <coughs> Dennis O'Hapsey. And Bunting says... He had an admirable method of playing staccato and legato, in which he could run through rapid divisions in an astonishing style. 
His fingers lay over the strings in such a manner that when he struck them with one finger, the other was instantly ready to stop the vibration so that the staccato passages were heard in full perfection. When asked the reason of his playing certain parts of the tune in that style, his reply was, that's the way I learned it. I can't play it any other way. And so on. In fact, Hempson's staccato and legato passages, double slurs, shakes, turns, braces, etc., etc., comprised as great a range of execution as has ever been devised by the most modern performers. So here's a performer of extraordinary... Yes? Did you mention Patrick Byrne? Mm. Do you want to mention Patrick Byrne? There's an article about Patrick Byrne, who was one of the revival students <coughs> in the 19th century, a couple of generations later, but having learned from tradition bearers through the lineage of Arthur O'Neill and Owen Keenan. And a newspaper article describes a performance that Byrne <coughs> gave of Brian Baru's march. And, he, and Byrne speaks a commentary as he goes, so it's a narrative piece. You know, now, ladies and gentlemen, he says, I'm going to play the celebrated march of the great King Brian to the field of Clontarf. The Irish army are far off, but if you listen attentively, you will hear the faint sound of their music. Then his fingers would wander over the upper range of strings with so delicate a touch that you might fancy it was fairy music heard from far off. Anything more fine, <coughs> more soft and delicate than this performance is impossible to conceive. And then, it, and then it's quite a long description. They are coming nearer, the sound increasing to the volume. The music rolled loud and full. The fingers of his right hand wandered further down the bass range. Um, and then when the fight starts, he says, um, the music suddenly changes to the middle range. It is hard and harsh, clang, clang, like the fall of sword or axe upon armour. The blow is showering thickly. And it carries on, and it, and it turns to a lamenting, and then it dies away at the end until you can't hear it at all. So we're getting this picture that they have enormous, uh, an enormous range, from very soft to very loud. But also kind of round and full and harsh and tight. Yes, they've got colour. It's, yes, exactly. They've got all sorts of different colours. So let's all think about that and think how we introduce that more into our playing. Uh, in the chapter where Bunting shows tables of melodic ornaments and bass hand chords, he uses a similar phrase. Instead of beginning with the lowest tone, as the moderns do... Uh, uh, sorry, all these graces, shakes double notes, chords, etc., had a different sound and expression according to the method adopted in fingering and stopping the vibration of the strings. So those of you who were at Sylvia's presentation will have started, hopefully, to think a bit more about your fingering. <coughs> and I find it interesting that he uses the word expression, a different sound and expression. So no monochrome playing if you want to be an HIP performer on early Irish harp. You need to have different colours, different volumes, and different timbres in your playing. So obviously this week you've all had a chance to play on harps that are contemporaneous with uh, early Irish harp music. Obviously its characteristics determine what works well and what doesn't work well when we play the repertory. So the metal strings uh, would give us the longer resonance and require damping. Fast scalic passages, that doesn't really work so well in our instrument. Close spaced triads don't work so well in the bass, I think. You might, you might disagree, but I think. Uh, thick, fast moving chords uh, that you might hear on, in modern harp uh, arrangements, that's not going to work well either. So let the instrument teach you. Then we have the tuning, the tuning systems, and I think uh, many of you went to Simon's Modes uh, talk, so we need to be thinking about all of those things as well. Obviously we have G to G tuning or G to G tuning with an F sharp. Um, so give yourself parameters. Don't just think, well I can tune any key and I can do anything. Give yourself parameters. Parameters are good because then you have to slightly struggle within them and you might come up with something very interesting. So it's always good to have a garden fence. And then you'll come across 
pieces you'll come across repertory from later sources. You'll see this. Um, you, a, a lot of you may come across uh, music in modern editions, and you'll see. I got my pen. pen. This. So you'll see. Uh, you'll come across accidentals and things like that. And then you have to come up with ideas about how to deal with those or the plausibility of them, whether they're real or whether they're later corruptions. So uh, tell me about this C sharp in this piece that has a home note of D. What's going on there? I've certainly heard it played this way. So is this, is this uh, a reasonable version? What do you think? Why, if it's not reasonable, why is there a C sharp there? Can we sing through it? Yes, yeah, sure. <laughs> So, Because the major minor. Uh, yeah, because they're, they're thinking in tonality rather than modality. So they're thinking, classical major and yeah. minor. Yes. Right. Yes, yeah. classical major and minor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so they're, well, they're thinking in, in, in tonal terms, and so they want they, they can't imagine a flat seventh. The C is the seventh note in that scale, and so they tend to always raise seven notes or six to seven notes. But, so, but those of you who came to the Mozart talk will know that a pentatonic minor scale has a strong flat seven mm -hmm. as an intrinsic part of a pentatonic right. minor note. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's just taking a modulation to D minor with the leading tone C sharp, just repeating the modus the starts in A minor and then it is the next thing over would be D minor. Yes, yeah. possibly. I mean, all of these things. Once you understand that it's later um, corruption and it's not part of, uh, it's not obviously not not uh, a harp version of the tune. It's not an early Irish harp version of the tune. Mm. Well, one thing that some certain American players use is a. It's like a sharpening ring. That's right. Of course, but, yeah, but if they used it right. in Ireland, it would have been mentioned. Yeah. So the danger for harpists is to retrieve our music from non-harp sources without evaluating what changes might have crept in because it was collected from someone who didn't play our instrument. If at all possible, of course, always look for a tune in a harp source like Bunting, and obviously not in his published works, but try and get back to the earliest, most scribbled draft you can find. A linchpin of HIP performance in European art music is to go to a composer's manuscript of the works, the primary sources, to see what they can teach us as performers. So why can't we do the same in, in Gaelic harp world? Why can't we go to primary harp sources, publications or manuscripts of the harpers themselves, and see, for example, you know, the whole bass texture? Why can't we do that? Yeah, oral tradition. Don't exist. Not, simply not possible. So we're left with the secondary sources. And of course, the main uh, sources you now know this week are the Bunting manuscripts. But outside Ireland, in other bits of the Gaelic world, we have other sources. So make yourself familiar with Scottish sources, if you're not already. So the music of 17th century Gaelic harpers in Scotland uh, survives where 17th century, there are no seven, not really any 17th century sources much in Ireland, but there are in Scotland. Because of course, literate art musicians heard the harpers and transcribed the tunes into their own uh, or they heard versions, maybe they didn't hear directly from harpers, but at some remove they wrote harp tunes into their handwritten music books. Uh, this is particularly true of lute players, so uh, have a look at 17th century lute manuscripts such as Weems, Balcaris, Skeen, and then later um, copies of things such as Strelot. 
They're interesting, of course, because the lute tablature shows the entire piece, not just the treble. So here, for example, is Strelok, but that's not an original. That's a, um, a 19th century copy, because the original is lost. But it gives you some idea. So you have the lute tablature, uh, the strings of the lute, and you have the entire texture along with the bass and the tune. Here's some bass. So that's quite valuable in case we can glean anything from the, the, the setting, from the style of the setting. And in fact, these pieces are really nothing like the French and English pieces which are in the same manuscripts. So that tells us something already. They're not uh, based, uh, they don't have an, uh, an independent base generally whereas the French and English music, uh, 17th century music, always does. Mm. So here's a transcription of that piece. I wonder if I can, let me see if I can make it bigger. Let me play you a little, a little bit of it so you can hear the kind of texture. Seventeenth century Scotland that we're seeing uh, in bunting in the 1790s. So I find that quite significant. That is a direct transcription of the. Yes, it is. Yeah. And then, of course, we have bunting's printed bunting's um, printed pages. And so, of course, these seem tempting. Possibly not to you now, who have a lot of experience but they seem tempting to people who want to approach this music because they're, they're legible, they're so much more readable than the manuscripts. But don't be seduced. <laughs> Let's be, don't be seduced because this, this is not where you're going to find uh, much of the truth. It looks way too complicated. <laughs> yeah, although you're not complicated, yeah, excellent. You're not tempted at all. So yeah, you have the thick texture, you have uh, key signatures that don't work for us. Uh, you have textures that don't work for us. So um, follow Caroline in not being, not being remotely attracted by them. <laughs> yeah, they're not, they're not Gaelic in style. They're shoehorned into major or minor keys. They have very busy textures. They're action-packed. They have chromatic notes. They are, in a word, they are in two words, piano music. So what you always want to go for is this, which may look similarly unappealing. Having said that, at our, um, at our class yesterday, to introduce those of you to the Bunting manuscript pages, um, we were merrily reading this. We had no trouble with it, with just a little bit of hand-holding yesterday. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with the does anybody want to point to the notes as I play them? I'll play it just for fun, so you can hear it. Uh, Maura, do you want to point? You can, you can stay where you are, probably, and just, and just point at the, at the relevant. Try not to put my eye out with a laser. That's the only thing I ask. Is it on? A lot of the old half of the blinds. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's working. <laughs> See, can you guys see it? It's weird because I can. How bizarre. Okay, so you'll just have to uh, use your best judgment and see if you can follow me at all as I play the first two lines.
find useful information that's going to help you to, to make HIP reconstructions. Thank you, Laura. So here, of course, we're seeing a much different idea to an idea of independent baseline, possibly a more ancient system where the treble, where the, the, the notes that you hear the bass hand playing, they're dependent on the melody. They don't have an independent life. They're echoing what the, what the melody, they're aping the melody. So you have G, 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 E, followed by E, B, with a fourth, D, followed by D, G, and so on, D, D. So octaves, in the gaps. Notice how they're in the gaps. Um, okay, let me show you something else. Okay, this is another piece that I pay a lot of attention to. Uh, I just want to make sure I'm doing this in the correct, yes. Okay, so Bunting, this is one of Bunting's piano pieces. The first page, I'm asleep and don't wake me. And of course, those of you, some of you have studied it this week. Can you tell me what it says at the bottom? This setting is exactly copied from Hempson, both bass and treble. Yee-haw! But as we found out in class, it's not that simple. So maybe it's not uh, exactly what Hempson play, played, but it certainly gives us um, a, lot of, a lot of pause for thought. And it's what we're seeing in the Luke manuscripts, and it's what we've seen in that um, crowded page of a piece called Lady of the Desert. So we're seeing... Actually, if I move the cursor, can you see that? Okay, maybe that's a better way of doing it. So we can see octaves, E flat going to E flat, D going to D, C going to C. Here we have D, C, A, C, D, F, and so on. So a lot of octaves in this piece. Um, obviously in the wrong, in a, not in a useful place with a B flat, but uh, a very interesting piece if we put it in a place where we can play it on our harps. Um, I could play all these things, but I think most people have heard me play this piece at some point. We can just press on, can't we? Yeah. Is that all right? Channel them and send them to your YouTube. Oh, yeah, my really well-supported YouTube channel where I put <coughs> up things all the time, that YouTube channel. <laughs> I think the only things that are on it are things that other people have put up on YouTube. I've never gone there. Um, God forbid that anybody would actually know me. So... Um, All right, let's look at, so Lady of the Desert, as we've seen, has notes in gaps, mm -hmm. in the melodic gaps. And then, let's have a look at the next slide. Okay, this is a variation of Lady of the Desert. And here you can see that the bass um, often has octaves in the gaps. So you have G, G. G, F, E, F, 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 E, D, G, G. So we're seeing this pattern of things in gaps, um, and it can be treble dependent, or it can be, you know, just an octave of what's in the, um, what's in the treble. We also have this, we see very clearly octaves in the iconic piece, Cool Queen on Albany. John Scott's Lamentation of Fru Thomas Purcell, the Baron of Loch Moe in Tipperary. And here, of course, we see octaves from the very beginning all the way through. This is a super interesting piece. For any of you who haven't worked on it yet, come back some other year and we'll, we'll run a class on this piece. So you can see octaves here, and you see clear octaves at the, at the end. Back to this page. There's so much one can learn on this page. Oops. Okay, so in these gaps, of course, we've seen single notes, but we see two notes, E and then EB, D, DG. So the interval of a fourth, the interval of a fifth, a fifth, a fourth, a fifth again. 
So these are all, use these as, you can, uh, you can see uh, patterns forming and you can develop templates yourself for what you should do when you're trying to, or what you could do when you're trying to reconstruct your tunes. Okay, this is another of these variation sets by Cornelius Lyons. Uh, very interesting chords. Here's something that Bunting describes in his uh, in his chart of graces and of bass hand patterns. And here's a, a real a real life co uh, chord. But look also in the bass here. These bass patterns. You have yabba dum bum, ba ba bum, yabba da dum, ba ba bum. Now you're starting to have little melodic. Uh, three note patterns, A, B, C, or G, A, B. So you can have little, little snippets of melody in the bass. <laughs> the other thing to watch out for are three note, um, so it's, this is a bit like Lady of the Desert plus one. So you have C, C, B, G, C, E, D, C, B, G, D, G. So you start to have sort of har little harmonic things almost in the bass. Uh, so the C is mirrored by C and you have the fourth, but you go back to the C. Here it's, it's positively harmony. There's no two ways around it. It's extraordinary. We have a B and a G, D, G. So you have this, this triad. Now, Plexi Connor of Carolyn, I'm showing you um, a piano arrangement of Bunting because we don't have a draft version of this. But I take this quite seriously as an indicator of how we might play this tune. You mean um, transcription? Sorry? You mean transcription? You don't have transcription. What did I say? A draft. A draft. We don't, well, we have neither a draft. Well, this might be a draft. I mean, oh, I see what you mean. Yes, good point. Thank you. We don't have a transcription direct from the harper. Um, but we, what we do have is something that looks quite un uh, unlike piano music. <laughs> so you have this, um, this the, 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 the tune moving between the treble and the bass hand. Treble, bass, treble, bass, treble. Same thing down here, bass, treble. And here, bass, treble, bass, treble. And we see this uh, even in transcription, uh, in transcriptions directly from Harpers uh, who are playing carolin. So I have no reason to think that this is um, Bunting being creative and making up a, a piano version that's like this. I think this gives us a good indication. I think it's fairly plausible that a Harper would have played something like this. And anyone who would have been in the beginner's class to fail the coin, you would have seen that straight off. Very good, yes. Yes, from the word go. Yeah, and it's, it's, a, it's a piano arrangement, but it says at that point, part bass. Exactly, thank you. Uh, then I've given you my transcription for Manuscript 29 just because it's so much easier to read. Here's a, a Carolyn piece which is taken from the playing of a harper and it does the same thing. Let me play you from, from bar 21, because it's better than me trying to be a soprano and a bass all in the same day. Yeah. So uh, from bar 21 it goes. division of the melody between the two hands. So it's a, a classic characteristic of Carolyn. But if you, again, I'd like to say, if you're not looking at harp sources, you would never know that. Most people take their Carolyn tunes from Donal O'Sullivan's Carolyn books, where he squashes them onto one stave, or they take them from O'Neill's Music of Ireland, the, the Thousand and One Tunes, uh, or they take them from, from all sorts of 19th century or 20th century sources. And then they're missing out what made them so special. It's because they were, in, in many of those collections, they were taken from fiddlers or flute players or whatever. So they have a smaller gamut. They have to 
compress the gamut, but we don't. So for heaven's sake, don't take your sources of harp music from non-harp sources. That's a real shame. You miss out on lots if you do that. Okay, now, this is something interesting I want to show you because you have one note in the bass, two notes in the bass, three notes in the bass, whole little melodic passages. Then finally in one tune, Schlieve Gallen, we get to a whole, um, a bass, a melody in the bass in one of the variations. This is an octave down, it's in the bass. Wow, a whole tune for the bass hand. Yes. Yep. And I might be completely wrong, but there's something. Um, just when you put that up, the Mallard Funk. Oh! Mm-hmm. Oh, um. And if you look at bar four, one yes, is three, yes. but it's written above the stage. Oh, wow. Yeah, oh, yeah. It's, above the stage. Yeah, it's very, this is a really interesting, ambiguous piece. I've never seen this. Oh, you've never seen Okay, yeah. you have to work on this piece because it's very ambiguous. Um, I think when we, uh, when we get. T- to here, I think it doesn't jump up a seventh. I'm not sure I believe that. I think it's just that it's impossible to write down there. So he writes it up an octave, but he goes bass. And the voice leading tells me that it goes from B down to A. Just it's the, it goes one note down. B A A E C C B C B A A. But you're right. This is very ambiguous. I think we should look at this. Okay, yes, please do, because I've been looking at this for years on my own. It just just flashes into my head. Yes. The one that we don't understand what on earth he's talking about. Yes. You have to explain to them what Mallard Funk is. So Mallard Funk in Irish means when you cross, when you you change something over. And uh, Mallard Funk, Bunting tells us, is where the hands crossed over. So the bass hand would play up in the treble. So the bass hand takes the place of the treble, yeah. so the treble takes the place of yes. the bass. So yeah, so I think... It's it's yes. Well, well, it's, yeah, it's this. It's, it's a swapping over. Yeah. Um, and so it, the, quest, the question for me is, if, if the bass hand plays this, then what, what, is it your third arm is playing this bottom A underneath mm-hmm. it? Like, how many arms do you need to play this tune? The example that he gives, he will yes. back down yes. again. Yes. Yes, so I, I, so I have thoughts about this that we can, we can discuss. If that's a bass, it's not a C. Should you not be reading that as bass? Uh, do you mean this? No. This note? Yeah, should you uh, not be reading yeah, that as yeah, the bass? Um, yes and no, because I think this is, this is, this is a B and A, wherever you play it, whichever octave you're playing it in, this is treble clef. This is all treble clef. And so the, the Sorry, the, I haven't understood you then. I thought that was bass there. It's, um, it's played in the bass hand, and it's the bottom voice of the texture, so therefore I'm calling it the bass. But it's actually still treble. But it's all... But it's, yeah, it's all, sorry, I should have said that. It's all, it's all on the treble. It's all on the treble clef. So here's C in the treble clef, and here's a middle C in the treble clef. Joanne, yes. you perhaps say that we think, we think that what this page represents is... Bunting is sitting beside the harp, but the harper is playing something that Bunting's never heard before, and this is what he writes while the harper is playing at full speed. So it's massively compressed shorthand notation. So let me play it to you so you get to hear it. So it's this C is the top one, this is the bottom one, and it goes. What I do is I cross over with my hands so that I have a hand free to play the bottom. So that my, my bass hand gives over into my treble hand so that my bass hand can play that bottom note, which Bundy clearly heard. But yes, all notated in the treble clef. So I thought everybody knew this piece. Yeah, it, yeah. Did you swap to normal for the last time? Possibly. Let's look at it later. Let's press oh, it. <laughs> but I'm very glad that it's piqued your interest. Okay, then of course we get to uh, chords. So we have uh, chords indicated in this other iconic piece, Fake and Glaish, this ancient tuning mm-hmm. prelude, and you can see uh, chords in the bass, uh, either played 
arpeggiated so that they sound possibly oh. almost together. Are they technically chords or are they bass melodies? I think of it, no, I think of it as a chord because it's all part, of, they're not melodies, it's all part of the one, the one sort of harmonic area. It's a G-ish thing and an A-ish thing and a G-ish thing and an e So look, Simon, do you see where the E-B-E -E is together? That's clearly a chord. Yeah. That's just the same thing but slightly arpeggiated. Yeah, it's the way he's given it time values though, it's not just... Smooth. Okay, but I see the whole thing. I see the whole thing as a chord, the first, the first thing. Uh, so... It's a chord, it's a, it's a G, okay, a G-ish thing. It's that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. So, there are no, there, there aren't many notes in that that don't belong to that harmonic, to that harmonic centre. Yes. Sorry, does somebody have, no, okay. All right, so moving swiftly, ever so swiftly along, because I'm almost out of time. Uh, so you get some sort of chords. In some pieces you get what in, in art music you would, oh, let me zoom this up, you get what, are, what you would describe as broken chords. So here again, it's more Cornelius Lyons, this wonderful harper from the 18th century who's influenced by European music. So, where's my cursor? Here, I'm going to start around here. This is the beginning of a variation that goes... So on, very European thing. And in the bass hand, he gives E, E, B, E, B, A. So E, B, E, B, E, B. So he's giving us a hint as to how you accompany it. And so on, okay? So you might not describe that. Uh, you could describe it in different ways. I, for the purposes of today, I'll just say that they're broken chords. Okay. But it's pretty explicit, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's, it's raw. There's no getting away from that. It's very explicit. Okay. So now we need to be pressing towards the end. Uh, mo I think you've all had a chance this week in various classes and workshops to look at Bunting's uh, charts of the grace notes and the chords and the bass notes, bass note patterns. Uh, two and three note patterns in the bass. So I won't go into them now. And in the treble? And in the treble, and in the treble, exactly. Well, two note patterns in the two treble. Two notes in the treble, yeah, thirds and fourths. Two note patterns in the treble, so thirds and fourths, and even more possibilities for the bass. So have a look at those, don't discount those either. So let's have the quickest of looks. There we go. So this thirds in the treble, fourths in the treble. And then in the bass, the octaves that we now know well from all the evidence we've seen in various countries in various centuries. Uh, but thirds also in the bass. <coughs> and then a whole plethora of different kinds of chords, some of which we've seen in evidence already in what we've looked at. Oh, there's the Mallard funk, where it <coughs> says one hand does one thing and the other hand takes over. So you can check that out there. Yes and no. Yes and no. Uh, maybe we don't have time to look at tuning sheets. All right, so... Um, so I think I, I think I think I can conclude rather soon, unless you have questions. Does anybody have any questions at this point? No? Nope. Fine. They go, questions? We, we're all heading for the door. One of them was a bit fugue-like, but in the night too. Oh, what did you say? About halfway down. About halfway <laughs> down. <laughs> a repeat rather short figure. Da, 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 da. Okay, so stop me when you think uh, you see. It was, I think, maybe a, transcri uh, a modern... Uh, oh, mo a modern transcription. So let's see. Could be that one. Could be this one. Miss yeah. Dillon. I, I thought, yeah, that was a bit fugue-like, I thought. It's certainly sequential, and it's so you get so you're right. They're sort of they're sort of like little fugetta entries, aren't they? It's, it's in the other hand, it's at the end of the second line. Yes. They're sort of, and it's interesting that you say fugue. So it reminds you of European music yeah. of the of the yeah. 17th and 18th century. Clearly, yeah, you're picking up the vibes and you're thinking, yes, they're sort of like little fugal entries. 
or little sequences, sequences and series of the kind that we find in Vivaldi and Corelli and Handel all the time. Except that there's a huge amount of stuff that you absolutely expect in Corelli and Handel that's completely... Absent. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So I've started, I think, over the last few months to call this, to call Carolyn style and a lot of this naive Baroque. They're sort of, they're, 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 they're aping, they can hear the Baroque composers, they're, they're clever people, and so they're trying to bring that style in, but they can bring in certain elements, like the, the little fugal entries, the little sort of sequences. Yeah. But they can't, but they're, they're, not doing, they're not doing the bass lines. It's not, I wouldn't say that they can't do them. They're, they, they're active, they could be actively choosing not to, because their tradition has a different aesthetic. Well, I, I just think it might be rather difficult. They might, they might well want to do it, but it's... it's you can't it'll assume be, that they're... We, yeah, they're you're right. So either they... You know, Leo Rosen yes. played Leo Rosen setting of that pipe tune, and Leo was quite capable of an Alberti bass yes. on the regulators. But most pipers actively choose not to do that. Yes, except that the Baroque, the independent Baroque bass lines that they were hearing, they actually couldn't reproduce. They probably generally couldn't reproduce in their harps because they're too chromatic, mm-hmm. because they're too complicated, because you can't damp them, because they're not idiomatic and they don't what about fit. Edgar McCain? And, um, and he playing, playing a diatonic wire strung Irish harp in the 18th century, and he went to Cambridge. And yes, the, and Manini and the in Cambridge. Masters, yes. The violin masters there were really impressed with his playing. Yes. And Edgar McCain, on his Irish harp, was played. playing the treble and the bass with other instruments. Yeah, of Corelli. Of Corelli. And so I think this is very interesting, but it's the subject of a whole other talk. Some of you. Uh, oh no, it was in one of the private classes. We looked at uh, a piece played by Dominic Mungan because he was the other one who was famous for playing, uh, for playing Corelli and Handel. But, but I think this is my point. For, uh, no, no, but to, no. Let me finish. No, let me finish. No, let me finish because there's a point to be made here about Dominic Mungan. We know one of his party pieces because it's named. They said his the favorite thing, the favorite Handel aria that he played was "Let Me Wander Not Unseen." from L'Allegro e Penseroso e del Moderato, which is the first uh, oratory of Handel, which was performed in Dublin in 1741. So I went to, to look, it's a piece I now play, so I thought, this is really interesting, we've got a named piece, let's have a look at it. Oh boy, is it interesting. The bass, it's a Siciliana rhythm, so it's yum, ta tom ti tom ta tom it's this sort of 12-8 rhythm. The bass line is extremely simple. It basically doesn't really move around much at all. So I think they're being super careful. They choose the things that they can manage to play on their harps, and they don't choose other things. So I think they're really choosing with care. So I bet Eklund O'Kane is choosing with care. And when I have time, one of the projects that I haven't managed to do yet is to, to, find, to go through Corelli and find all these adagio movements that might be diatonic enough that you could play a treble and bass. So you're right. They, but, but I think, you see, they want to do it, but they, don't, they do it where they can, where the basses are, lend themselves to be played on the harp, but there are other places where they can't. Or some of them. Or some of them, yes. some of them want to. And then it's just, it's yeah. naive Baroque. It's what you see in Carolyn. He's getting the, the superficial flavour of it, but not the substance of the music, okay? Can, well, Sylvia so said some of them. Can I say that one of my future research wishes, even, because I'm not even sure I'm going to do it, yeah. is that I think there were different lineages and traditions of playing the Irish harp. And I think that different groups of harpers, maybe in different families or maybe in different parts of the country, really quite different. Well, I used to think that. I used to think that until uh, Simon basically gave me my Christmas present early this year. He found a quote that most of you will have heard by now this week, but in case you haven't, I wanted to read it to you. We have uh, Simon's made photocopies of the source and the quote outside there on the table. And this was the absolute light bulb moment for me because the question that I always wondered, thought about was I thought, well, I'm studying from a PhD, basically, uh, Dennis O'Hampsey and his, his base hand. That's what, what I'm interested in. And so I've always worried. I thought, well, I know what Dennis O'Hampsey's up to and some of the others, like Charles Fanning, but what was Carolyn up to? Because he's supposedly very Baroque and he's aping this Baroque style. So maybe, maybe he's very successfully putting in uh, an independent bass line. So this has been my worry all along, and I thought... And we have the, yes. the harpsichord arrangements yes. by his son. By his son, it has an independent bass. And so this has kind of worried me to death for years, thinking maybe my hypothesis 
is really quite flawed because I don't know what Carolyn did and maybe he's exceptional, maybe he's not like Ohampsey. Maybe Ohampsey is exceptional because he's the oldest guy who's playing. So I thought I might be basing my thesis on one old guy and everybody else, are, they're more up to date and they're doing something different. But in fact, uh, what Simon found and I can't thank you enough because it is, it, is the, the, it is the quote that I have no right to hear. It's the sort of thing that you could never hope to hear in your lifetime. It's the perfect quote and you found it for me because it could, it's a quote about Carolyn's playing and it could be, well, Carolyn was wonderful or Carolyn was useless or Carolyn's basses were extraordinary. Well, that tells you nothing. You know, that, that would make me even more, even more uh, uh, panicked. Listen to this for a quote. Uh, this is from um, an encyclopedia, an English encyclopedia from the early 19th century, um, where the, they're, they're, he's talking about the harp and he's putting together all these little factoids about the harp. And in the middle of all of this, and some of it's true and some of the factoids we know are not true, in the middle of it there's this fabulous statement. Carolyn's tunes had no bass to them originally. What? 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 what, what? <laughs> Carolyn's tunes had no bass to them originally. As we have been informed by the late Kane Fitzgerald, a native of Ireland and a good judge of music, who had often seen and heard old Carolyn perform. It was only after his decease in 1738, so now, wow, we're getting rid this guy's really specific. We have dates, we have people. It's only after his decease in 1738 that his tunes were collected and set for the harpsichord violin and German flute with a bass, Dublin folio by his son, who published them in London by subscription in 1747. Wow. So I take this profoundly seriously because he's talking about someone who he says has heard Carolyn. And this person is obviously erudite enough that he can, he can hear Carolyn's bass and he can compare it to a known... Um, publication which we still think we have copies of, which does show an independent, uh, uh, independent baseline. And he compares what he heard Carolyn do and what Carolyn's son what published. What he often heard Carolyn what do. What he often heard Carolyn do and what Carolyn's son published. And he said, yeah, they're completely different. This is one thing, that's another. They're not the same. Carolyn had no basis. Now, obviously, I don't think that that means, and I'm out of time to really discuss this, I don't think that that mean, ca means Carolyn had no bass. We've already seen in some of the Carolyn transcriptions, uh, we go treble, bass, treble, bass. You have, you have whole little, little melodic passages. So it's not that Carolyn had no bass, but that it's Carolyn, for somebody who had a European music ear, who was used to Italian music, Carolyn had no bass. It means he had no bass as I understand it. Mm. According to my understanding of music, Carolyn had no bass. But of course, if you hear any of the things I played at the concert the other night, what I've just played you now, where there is no independent bass, there's no harmony. It's working in octaves. It's working little melodic things in gaps. Yeah, you, a, a European ear would say, yeah, there's no bass there. So I think we're, I th I'm, I'm happy that I think I'm on the right track with what I'm thinking about the bass hand. So uh, to, to finish off, I would like, just like to say thank you, Simon. <laughs> <laughs>